Hi, I'm Sam Zellner. I'm leading the PQII effort. I'm also the co-founder of Inspire IP, and you're listening to IP Fridays. Hello, and welcome to this episode of IP Fridays. Our names are Ken Suzanne and Rolf Clayson, and this is the podcast dedicated to intellectual property. It does not matter where you are from, in-house or private practice, novice or expert. We will help you stay up to date with current topics in the fields of trademarks, patents, design and copyright, discover useful tools, and much more. Welcome to episode 118 of IP Fridays. Today's guest is Sam Zellner. If you don't know who Sam is, he is a prolific inventor of over 200 patents. He has been managing the whole patent portfolio for AT&T, a big telecommunications giant. And he is now in charge of an open source project, PQAI, a patent search project based on artificial intelligence. And I'm really happy to have him on the show today. But before we go into the interview, I want to share some news with you. The enlarged boards of appeal have to decide on a really important case at the European Patent Office at the moment, G1 in 21. And this case is about whether video conferencing can be made mandatory for oral proceedings and whether there needs to be consent of both parties or not. And the president of the EPO has recently um, filed his his own written observations uh, with the enlarged board of appeal and he is of the opinion that uh, no consent of the parties is needed since video conferencing is since another alternative and uh, of oral proceedings and that video conferencing is equivalent to in-person proceedings. Another important thing that I wanted to share is that the EU IPO has abandoned fax, so you cannot send and communicate with fax anymore or it's phasing out quickly. So there is a big problem because either you could um, communicate electronically, but this has not been possible in all proceedings so far and not for all cases. So. Um, the alternative would have been only by regular mail. And to address this issue, the EU IPO has introduced a new option in the user area of registered users. If you log into your user area uh, under the tab communications, you find a new button correspondence alternative. So if you are unable to file electronic communication, uh, within a certain case, for example, I had a recent case where I wanted to file grounds for um, a design um, revocation action, and there is no way in the online file to press a button, submit grounds for the um, revocation action. Um, then I am now I was now able to click on correspondence alternative. So there's a button correspondence alternative in the user area. And there you can submit and upload a PDF and um, giving the EPO, EP, EU IPO your the, the uh, number for the design to be revoked, for example, or the case number, and then they can um, put it, um, then they can direct it to the file in within the IP, EO IPO. One other thing I wanted to share with you is that the German Patent and Trademark Office is um, conducting in-person oral proceedings again, starting from 1st of June 2021. And um, so, yes, um, be aware that in-person proceedings are now possible again at the German Patent and Trademark Office starting from 1st of June 2021. And now let's jump into the interview with Sam Zellner. Today's guest is Sam Zellner. If you don't know who Sam is, he's managing high-tech innovation portfolios leveraging intellectual property. 
He holds a BA in, that, in Industrial Engineering from Northwestern University, as well as an MBA in Finance from the University of Chicago. He joined the telecommunications industry in 1981 and climbed up the ranks within AT&T Empire quickly. In his last position, he was the executive director of patent development with AT&T and established the Innovation Pipeline Program, an internal innovation program that has over 17,000 ideas and more than 120,000 members. Thank you, Sam, for being on the show. Thank you. Appreciate this opportunity. Sam, you have over 200 patents and you managed all the patents for AT&T. And you also founded this uh, innovation pipeline program and many other initiatives. You have a lot to do with innovation. So um, how did that lead to the development of the open source tool PQAI and what is it? <laughs> sure, sure. Well, uh, like, like you said, I have been through the innovation process quite a bit on my own and also uh, worked with hundreds of inventors uh, along the way within my career at AT&T. And what I saw there was sort of a common thread. Uh, inventors just have a very hard time understanding what has already been developed. You know, a lot of people go to Google and they search Google to see what current products are out there, but that's really not what you need to do when you're inventing because it's really about ideas, not necessarily whether somebody has launched the product. Obviously, that's important, but that's not. You want to understand what people have thought about, how people have looked at these problems and how they've tried to address them and see if they've even thought of the way you have thought about it. And so that was one aspect that uh, I saw just commonly uh, a barrier to a lot of inventors. Also, when you apply for a patent, it's just it's odd to me that we have no clue as to what the examiner is going to use to, to search. And in an ideal world, and I know we're not in an ideal world, but in an ideal world, wouldn't it be nice to be able to use the same tool as the examiner? And yeah. that would be so nice. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, well, just so I, you know, I'm uh, I'm a little bit of a dreamer here, you know, uh, and I think that's what all inventors are. And so, um, so I said to myself, well. Wouldn't there be a way in which we could create a tool to do the searching similar, you know, that in a way similar to the examiner that the examiner could use, that the inventor could use, so we could see what's out there? Because it's this is not, uh, you know, this is public data. This is, you know, just to, to talk about truth. We still might argue or, or negotiate on whether something is covering my idea or not, but it wouldn't be about trying to find the document. So that serves. Sort of Got me started. You know the the group at uh, the intellectual property group within AT and T is is a super team there. Scott Frank and and others there are uh, really creating a, a lot of good uh, IP. And so Scott was open to the idea of let's try to create something. And and he also liked the idea of making it open source so that not only would it help AT and T but it help everybody. And you know. Realistically, a better search tool means higher quality patents. It's it's good for everyone. Yes, sure. So that answered one of my questions. Why did you make it uh, open source? Uh, it just it was just altruism, basically, <laughs> to, to <laughs> well, help everyone. It obviously <laughs> helped AT and T too. So yes, uh, yeah, but, but uh, yeah, very nice move to make this uh, program. Um, open source. So this is a, like a search tool for prior art, um, PQAI. So how does it work? Like what is the technology behind this? Um, how did you implement it? Because there are a lot of uh, patent search engines already and databases where you can search for prior art. But how does it, how is that different and how does it work? Sure, sure. So that's a really good question because, uh, as you said, there are a lot of search engines out there. So you know, what is different? Why do we need another one, so to speak? But the, the difference here is that um, we're trying to target the inventor because, again, getting back to the original issue here, a problem is, is that too many inventors spend time on ideas that aren't novel. And so it's, it's, you know, it doesn't mean it can't be a good idea, but you, know, you want to know that before you spend a lot of time and resources on it. So we needed to make it simple enough for just the common inventor to utilize. And what you see is a lot of the search engines out there, the Boolean search engines, are very complex. You need to create very complex strings. 
even you know ironically if you look at the patent office whether it's the EPO or or the USPTO and you read what they recommend inventors doing it, it's almost humorous you know they they tell you that if you know you're using a boolean search engine and you're trying to search on a mouse trap uh, you know you got to recognize that a mouse trap might bring up you know 200,000 documents and so that might not be too useful and they say you need to try different versions of that and basically, they all say that in the end that if you don't find something, you're not spending enough time. Well, that doesn't really help me too much. Or, or <laughs> that you really you should get a professional searcher. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's basically the answer to them. So, you know, not much, much use there. Um, so we said we need to make a search engine that's simple enough that anybody could use and also recognize that there's a time element here. We we can't afford. None of us can afford to spend weeks looking at some at some idea. So um, we looked out there and see what might be a game changer. And of course, you know, everybody's talking about it nowadays is artificial intelligence and also natural language processing. Those two components really made a big difference in driving PQAI and, and what really got us excited about the opportunity. Because with natural language processing, as you'll see with PQAI, you can just describe your idea in you know a few sentences, you know, and uh, it, the system will understand "quote unquote" what what you're talking about. And then the other piece is the AI. The AI is now uh, allows us to train it like a like any person these days. Keep it in simple language and, and understand the, the concepts and how the concepts might be utilized in different ways. Uh, this eliminates this whole complex complexity of a Boolean search engine of what are the keywords and all that. You know, with AI, by training it through patent and non-patent data, it now understands that if you're talking about wireless, you might be talking about 5G, you might be talking about Wi-Fi, you might be talking about Bluetooth or some other wireless technology. So it has understandings, it's seen how people have used the terminology in the past, and the beauty is, is as we use new terminology, we can train it on the new terminology. So this mm -hmm. allows you to do a search and make it a very rigorous and comprehensive search uh, with results. And another component to this, uh, what we, we're doing here, which is different, is we decided it needs to be in the top 10 results. And that's a very high bar, but it's critical because again, if I, if I give you 100 documents that's a lot of documents to go through and very you know very time consuming well, our feeling was we should be able to get relevant documents in the top 10 and yes. so that was our goal to it and also you also see another key component to uh pqi which again is is very unique is we also map and those patent attorneys out there will recognize claim charts right we're doing claim charts on the prior art to your concept and so we're ba basically matching each component. So your idea was A, B, and C. We're going to match the documents and the components within the document that relate to A and relate to B and relate to C. This makes it much easier for you to evaluate the document to see if it's really relevant to your idea without having to read through the whole document. So that's another component. We just you know provided efficiency here that you don't see in any other search engine. So and basically I, you're saying, just one question in between before I lose the thought. So you're <laughs> saying um, like um, if I search for, for example, feature A, um, the program PQI tells me exactly like where to find the corresponding text in the prior art document corresponding to feature A and the uh, corresponding text to feature B and C. Exactly. Wow, and that's very what's, powerful. What's, it's, it's right. much better than, you know, a lot of the documents, a lot of systems right now will highlight keywords throughout the mm -hmm. document. But if it's a, if it's a common, say it was wireless, you know, it's going to be all over the document. And so that, right. that doesn't really help you. This is where we try and string together the things that relate to your idea so you can see whether that's really your idea or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry, I interrupted you. <laughs> no, no, so the other component here is, and again, this is more US based than European based, but we also do two types of searches. Uh, so we do uh, what would be a single reference search or in the US terminology, a 102 rejection from the, the patent examiner. And then we do a combinational search. And a combinational search in the US system, um, 
the examiner can say, look at Rolf, your idea is A and B. Uh, or, and so we found one document with A and one document with B, and so we can combine them because it would have been obvious to combine mm -hmm. these two things. And now we have your idea. And yeah. that's called a 103 rejection. And that right. turns out to be, in most cases, the most common rejection, not surprising yes. at all. Yes. And so the crazy thing is, is there is no search engine out there, to my knowledge, that does that today. So we are the first ones to do that. And we think since it's the most, in most cases, the most common rejection you'll get at the patent office, it, it seems like a, a natural to have a tool that would tell you what the examiner is going to try and use. Very powerful, yeah. And in Europe, it's called inventive step. You call it obviousness, but it's always, I think uh, ah, it's a unique, true. it's a system that is uh, present in all patent offices uh, to uh, assess inventive step or obviousness, right? So mm -hmm. that's that's very cool, very cool feature. Yes, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we think that's going to make it very attractive to uh, a lot of users. Mm -hmm. Um, before before we had the interview, we talked about the tool briefly, and uh, you mentioned that the um, tool is also language independent. So, uh, or it, it it might be in the future. So the the free search engines that are out there on the market today, like Google Patents or, for example, Espasnet or other patent search engines that are out there, the, you ha you have to search like in the in the languages that the documents are otherwise the the other the prior art is not found and for example in patent scope you can then combine different translations of different terms and so it's a little bit more sophisticated but still very complicated but you are saying uh, that you can you you try to achieve language independence so tell us more like how how do you do that like do you, yeah, do you translate all the prior art documents or how do you do that? So so this is a, another big change in the way we, you know, we've really tried to think out of the box in terms of, of search engines. So in what we're trying to do with PQAI is actually we take your idea. Well, first of all, one thing I should highlight just right off is privacy is really important with PQAI. So the idea that your, your search is kept private. We realize that this is really you know, important to inventors. So you know, that's one of our goals here. So what PQI does, which is unique, is, is when it, you put in your idea into it, a natural language, it translates it into a vector, right? And that's probably true to a lot of search tools, but it translates it into a vector. What's unique with PQI that we created is this ability to network PQI search engines. So therefore, if I have a, a search engine and it has access to uh, a database, um, it can get access to other databases by communicating with other PQI search engines that might be deployed throughout the world. Mm -hmm. the, the key thing here is, is that because we translate your idea into a vector, we can now send it to that other PQI search engine and they can't tell if someone tried to spy on your idea they can't tell what your idea is because it's a vector and it's mm -hmm. it's not a unique vector so to speak exactly so that so they can't actually decompose it and say oh this is what you were thinking they might have a general no notion but they wouldn't know so but we still you know we're sending it over secure uh connections to the other uh, pqi search engine and because it's a mathematical model now it doesn't matter what language my idea is in because it's a mathematical model. So they can take the, the index of whatever documents they have in whatever language and compare them because they have those in mathematical models. So they can say these two documents are similar based on their mathematical models. They don't need to translate them. They can send you back if you put your, your concept in German they can send you a document back in English or in Chinese or whatever language. And they know that mm -hmm. the concepts are close. Um, so you know, that's where you really have a unique uh, capability within PQAI, along with the fact that now setting up a PQI server, you wouldn't have to have a copy of the, all the databases because you're communicating with other servers that have databases. You don't need to bring down a copy of that database, make it much easier to deploy a PQI server. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so for example, if I'm searching for taking your example of wireless, for example, a wireless mouse or something, um, then this concept of wireless is translated into a mathematical model, this vector, and then this vector is language independent. It's, it describes the concept of wireless independent of language, so you can search in Chinese and in India, in documents in, in other languages, basically, um, for the same technical concept because it's just a math uh, translated into a math math mathematical model. Right, or into a vector. It's translated mm -hmm. into a vector. Into a vector, right. a vector representation of the idea. And then basically they're looking at their vectors within their database and say, hey, these two vectors are very close. Then the ideas must be close. And they could send you back that document. But they will not have translated that document into whatever language you, 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 you're using. So you would mm -hmm. get the document uh, and then obviously you'd have to translate it. Mm -hmm. But that's, you know, that's really, uh, we think, a very powerful piece here is now all yes. of a sudden you can be searching in, you know, every language uh, yeah. without having to translate anything. Certainly. So, um, yes, that's exciting. <laughs> Thank you very much for giving us like an introduction into the technology behind PQAI. Mm -hmm. But I want to dive into another aspect of PQAI. In the beginning, you mentioned that your main goal is that the tool is for everyone, and especially the layman inventor who doesn't have any clues about patent law and patents, and he has a first invention, and he he's clueless like what to do, how to search. Like, how does that influence the goal? Um, how does that goal basically influence the technology behind the tool? How, how do you make it easiest for the layman inventor to use the tool? Well, that's that's why we've done, you know, the key thing is just put it in a natural language, you know, just describe your idea. You don't have to worry about, you know, inventors can usually describe their ideas fairly well from what I experience. And then, then you're providing them results in a simple way in which they can read through and interpret. But you know, leading to that, you know, again, we're not trying, and I think this is very important. We're not trying to replace the patent attorney. We're not trying to replace the patent examiner and all this. What we're trying to do is accelerate in a innovation, and and we do that by empowering inventors right in the very beginning, rather than you know, in today's world, you know, inventor comes up with an idea, you know, thinks at some level that their idea is novel then hires a patent attorney and that patent attorney in most cases will say we need to do a prior art search and you know we'll we'll hire a professional and that'll cost you you know maybe several thousand dollars and then they'll come back and they might say your idea is not really novel uh, there's a lot of art out there that seems very similar to your idea and now the inventor has spent a number of thousand uh, you know multiple thousands of dollars on it and a lot of time on it and now it's in the quandary do i still go for it or not and all that um you know what we want to do is have this so that the inventor right on their own can figure out does it you know how novel is this and again we're not saying that you have to be novel to have a good business obviously lots of people launch businesses that are successful but if you think novelty or differentiation is going to be important to your business case you sure would want to know that uh, the other piece here that's important for inventors is not only do you want to know that your idea is novel or not and not spend a lot of time on it or at least account for it if it's not, you, you're, you're going to potentially go to a patent attorney, but you're also maybe going to a venture capitalist and you might want you know, funding. You might want to communicate to the venture capitalist, this idea is novel, this is you know, the unique idea. Well, it would be helpful for the inventor to have something that would provide some level of credibility on that. And that, that leads you know, to something we're developing right now and I'm really excited about is a report. You know, one of the other things that no search engines really provide in an effective way is some sort of report that I could hand my patent attorney, that I could hand a venture capitalist, I could hand a potential partner, anybody to say, look at this is why I believe my idea is novel. Here are some of the people involved in this space and why my idea is different or how they've thought about it and all that. Um, mm -hmm. we're, and, and I want to be careful here. We're not trying to make a super expansive, you know, we're not trying to do landscapes to all, you know, those are very important things, but not those are not things we're trying to do. We're not trying to, 
to solve all problems in IP. We're taking a very small slice. We think that this tool, when it's open source, can be useful for building landscapes. There'll be a lot of applications we don't realize, but we're taking it just a narrow piece to get excitement about it, to solve and drive innovation and, and get a community behind it. Think of it, you know, not to be too grandiose about this, but think of it almost like Linux, right? We're trying to do a tool like Linux um, to change the industry. And we don't expect that we're going to replace all search engines. We expect there will be other search engines out there for, for a numerous reasons, but we think we will be uh, uh, an important component within the industry. Very, very cool. <laughs> Exciting times. <laughs> So one question, of course, that I have is like, how does it compare to other search engines, like from the quality of the results? Did you compare different, like like the same search in different like search engines and compare the results to your results? Like, and, and what did you find there? Ironically, that's a great <laughs> question. And, and, and one we, we sort of struggled with because ironically, there is no benchmark for search engines, right? So, so you know, yeah. what do you use? And 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 I think a lot of people immediately say, well, you use patent examiner, right? But <laughs> we know from the statistics uh, that you know patent examiner's quality vary. And so you know, you know can, is that the right measure to use? So we really struggled with this quite a bit, to tell you the honest truth. Um, you know, because we want to do a fair and and uh, rigorous. Uh, uh, analysis. So what we did was we took concepts from patents, summarized them, and, and put them into the different search engines um, and, and ran them. And we wanted to again see, did they come in the patent that we summarized? Did it come in the top three? Did it come in the top five? Did it come in the top 10? Because again, our goal is not to have it come in the top 100 or top 1,000. That, that mm -hmm. just doesn't help too much. And so when we did that with some of the, the major search engines, we found that uh, PQI actually performed better when it, in terms of top three in getting the patent coming up in the top three and in the top five. And it was competitive in the top, um, top 10. So you mean we were, the, you mean coming up with a patent that the examiner found as the most relevant hit, or no, no, we took oh, the no. patent, summarized the concept down, ah. and said, okay, let's see if we can find this patent. Let's see ah. if the search engines can I find see, this patent. I see. And okay. so uh, there, that was sort of our you know oh, yes. uh, proof that says you know can you find this patent that we've summarized the concept to? Yes. And so yeah. that was the test we we performed. At the same yeah. time, we're working with Carnegie Mellon on creating a benchmark that would be, you know, there's a lot of aspects that, you know, that uh, a benchmark needs to cover to compare search engines. So we have that initiative going on too. And we're excited about that. We think it's going to take a little bit longer to do, but, but uh, getting back to your original question, we think that uh, PQI uh, performs, uh, if not better, at least on par with, uh, with all the major search engines. Cool. Yeah, I tried it as well, and yeah, I found some very interesting documents, prior art documents. Mm -hmm. um, so, so um, what is the outlook like? What is happening next? Uh, you're saying it's open source. Um, will it be available? Like, like you say, anyone can install a PQAI server. Like, um, uh, how do you see the like distribution? Um, if you go to the website now, you can just search in PQAI, but people also can install it locally, like on their own servers, and then search internal in their own internal network, and they don't have to go out on the internet, and and so it will be even more secure. Or how does that work? And and what is like the is there like a top ten feature list or a top three feature yeah. list that people want to want you to add? Like what is the most requested things that should be added? On I'm just interested where it yeah, goes. Like yeah, <laughs> yes, yes, you asked it. So so we're we're sort of you know crawl walk run right. That's how they say. It. Uh, so you know crawling was we got the search engine out there in November, so it's still quite new, uh, and we have the website in which people can run it. Um, we, what we're doing now is we're creating an API to allow people to run it and integrate it into their website. 
uh, or into their application or whatever. And that, and we're working on that. And and a number of people uh, look like they'll be doing that. So you know, excited to uh, hopefully announce that soon. Um, we're then you know, trying to um, build out um, uh, the wherewithal and the infrastructure to set up a you know a GitHub repository to uh, launch it as an open source initiative. You know it, that's a little more complicated, and so we're not quite there yet. But that would be the goal. So you know we provide people three options: you can either just use it on the website for free. You can get an API and integrate it into your system, or ultimately we'll, we'll have it on the website or in the GitHub site, and so developers can download the software and, and implement it. And as you said, you can implement it as just your private PQI server within your own database. Um, we know we have some customers who are using it that way to, to look at their own disclosures and you know verify their own disclosures. And then you, know, you could create um, you know, create your own PQI server that might be public in some level and, and interconnect it with other PQI servers. So that's another piece, that whole networking piece. You know, we're, we're working on that protocol and getting that protocol adopted to, to have that out there. So uh, a lot of big things happening, uh, hopefully this year, to make all this together, bring this together. So what are your users requesting most? Like what what is the like what what are they wanting you to implement next <laughs> well, everything yeah you know, everything <laughs> of course <laughs> yeah. but, uh, i think one of the things like i said is the report is a big right. we just got yes. over you know and again these things seem obvious but when you have your long list of things you know people are saying images so we got images in there um okay. that was a big piece um we have um and you know, a bigger database is people want more databases. You know, we have the U.S. Uh, database and a non and a scholarly database, but of course, you know, the European databases would be very important. Uh, you know, and they have a, they have a good API. You know, the EPO has a good API. You can just uh, query their whole database and. Well, it's, it's actually, we need it in a little more sophisticated manner, right? API is good for okay. queries, but we need to index the whole database. Okay, yes. So that's where it's it's a, you know, a little more complicated uh, than just a query. But we're, we're yes. actually talking to a number of PTOs and things like that. So there's a lot of exciting stuff going on. Um, yeah. But uh, we are, you know, definitely that's another biggie is, is uh, you know, expanding the database, of course. Yeah, very good. So if your listeners uh, still have questions after this interview, so where where can they reach you? Where can they send you the questions? And where can they find out more about PQAI? <laughs> so if you go to projectpq.ai, you'll see the website. That also leads to the search engine, so you can try it out. And I encourage everybody to try it out. It's, it's quite a, a lot of fun and, and very interesting and simple to use. We've also, you know, one thing we didn't talk about is we've added some components within the the search engine piece when you use it online, uh, where it keeps track of your searches and your search history, a sort of a thread, and so you can see as you evolve your idea how how it worked, and you can go back and forth that way. And and rest assured, that's on your browser on your local machine, so nobody else can see your thread and how you've been doing it. Um, but uh, you know, I would go there and try it out. If you have questions or thoughts or uh, you know anything, you can reach me at sam at PQ, projectpq.ai. It's that simple. Very simple. Well, that was really exciting for me to hear about your project PQAI. Thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you. I appreciate this opportunity. That's it for this episode. If you liked what you heard, please show us your love by visiting ipfridays.com slash love and tweet a link to this show. We would be so grateful if you would do that. It would help us out to get the word out. Also, please subscribe to our podcast at ipfridays.com or on iTunes or stitcher.com. If you have a question or want to be featured in one of the upcoming episodes, please send us your feedback at ipfridays.com feedback. Also, please leave us a review on iTunes. 
you can go to ipfridays.com slash iTunes and it will take you right to the correct page on iTunes. If you want to get mentioned on this podcast or even have comments within the next episode, please leave us your voicemail at ipfridays.com slash voicemail. You have been listening to an episode of IP Fridays. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of nor are they endorsed by their respective law firms. None of the content should be considered legal advice. The IP Fridays podcast should not be construed as legal advice or legal opinion on any specific facts or circumstances. The contents of this podcast are intended for general informational purposes only, and you are urged to consult your own lawyer on any specific legal questions. As always, consult a lawyer or patent or trademark attorney. Copyright 2014. All rights reserved.